Live from the Computer History Museum in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE. Covering OpenStack Silicon Valley 2016. Brought to you by Mirantis. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Lisa Martin. Welcome back everyone, we here live in Silicon Valley for OpenStack SV, for Silicon Valley OpenStack SV. This is SiliconANGLE Media's The Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, my co-host Lisa Martin. Our next guest is Andrew Randell, is the CEO, founding CEO of Tigera. Welcome to The Cube. Great to be here. So as an entrepreneur, first tell us a little about your company and then what's going on here at OpenStack for you? Yeah, so uh, Tigera is all about securing cloud networks, so we think there's a real problem with how, um, you know, as we move to more and more densely packed uh, data centers, how do you secure those workloads? And um, so we actually came up with a project uh, about a couple of years ago called Calico uh, within a larger company called Metaswitch. And um, you know, as this started to gain momentum, we realized we needed to set up a, uh, a startup to really take, make the most out of this project. So we launched that in May and uh, we support OpenStack, we support container environments, and so being here where we're starting to see OpenStack moving more towards and embracing those container environments is kind of natural uh, meshing of you know, multiple ecosystems that we're involved in. And how big is the company size-wise, funding? Can you share some particulars? Sure, so uh, we're about 15 people right now, um, but hiring, um, <laughs> bringing a lot of engineers on board, community advocates, uh, product management, all of those things we need to do to scale the company. Um, we raised uh, a round of 13 million from uh, New Enterprise Associates uh, and Wing VC, and so we announced that back when we launched the company in May. Great, yeah, two great VCs, NEA, obviously yeah. uh, Legend, and Wing VC, XXL Partners exactly. uh, guys. So they know infrastructure. Yeah. They know switching, networking, all that stuff. So. As that OpenStack world evolves from, we see all the SDN action, certainly NFV being a big popular use case, the Kubernetes Docker madness has changed the game. It's like putting a new, new fruit in the blender, changes color, right? It's a whole nother shake up here. What is the impact of Dockerization and this new orchestration on Kubernetes? What does it mean for OpenStack and ultimately customers? Yeah, I mean, I. I'd rather think of it as the sanity coming into the game rather than madness, <laughs> right? So um, I think the, we've seen the architectures that Docker are being- Sanity, that's Docker a new sanity. hashtag. There you go. <laughs> Docker Sanity. Jerry Chen will love that. The, the, these new architectures that are being built for containers just make a lot of sense for um, you know, the new style of applications, right? So certainly the kind of enterprises that we're working with, mostly le leading edge kind of enterprises, that's where they're looking to target their new application developments, uh, but they need solid infrastructure as well to build those app apps on and to take, bring the legacy apps into that new world as well. So, you know, it, it, it's made sense to us for a long time that these two worlds need to coexist. And I, and I think that the fact that the community is just starting to really make this happen is, is really exciting. Do you think there's a level of maturity as well. Do you think it's been a shot in the arm, so to speak, for OpenStack community to have that Docker um, sanity, if, as you say, come in, because that seems to give some freedom to the developers. Yeah. To yeah. play, but yet let the build out of OpenStack certainly mature, it's been maturing. But fill in the gaps, if you will, the white spaces. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's addressed some questions that people have had about what is the migration path to the future, right? So they've seen a, you know, a, sh a shining city on the hill, right, of, of cont containers and microservice based applications and there's been a gap between where they are today and where yeah. they want to get to, and so it's kind of paved that, that road for them, so I think that's going to open up a whole lot of innovation. It's also, to be honest, you know, plugged some uh, holes that there were with OpenStack. If you talk to anyone that's deployed OpenStack, uh, you know, I was just at a reception last night talking with a, a large um, cable company that had deployed an older version of OpenStack, a lot of, a lot of workloads in production and didn't know how to move it up to a more recent version. That, that kind of you know, upgrading has, has been impossible up to now and running it on Kubernetes where you can just kind of terminate services, bring them up again, it's, it provides a much better deployment environment for OpenStack. A little more elegant than the lift and shift, bring in the old, exactly. get exactly. rid of the old and exactly. bring in the new. Yeah, I mean, 
the previous strategy was always burn it down, rebuild. Yeah. And you know, that works for an early stage project, but if you're really talking about something that should be thought of as mature enterprise technology, you, know, you, you, need, you need a more of an elegant underpinning. So one of the things that interests me is wanting to kind of dig into security. One of the things that was talked about today around the uh, OpenStack days here is challenges around security, kind of the one of the age old cloud challenges, right, that customers of all sizes face. But also um, want to explore what it is that Tiger is doing. What are you doing to mitigate some of those security challenges that customers are facing when you're working with cloud native applications? Yeah, I think if you look at the data breaches, you know, there have been a lot of very highly publicized data breaches over, over the years, and they, they keep coming, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the one thing most of them have in common is that people have broken through perimeter security, and once they're on one server in the network, uh, to, to jump to the next one, to jump to the next one, is, is actually relatively trivial, right? So, um, one of the things that we're trying to do is to move away from the, the idea of just virtualizing the old three-tier architecture to really describing at a very fine-grained level who should be allowed to talk to whom under what circumstances and then detecting when things are happening that shouldn't be happening, right? So locking down every workload, putting, if you like, a micro firewall on every workload's virtual interface, not just kind of around the edge of, edge of a network, but literally around every microservice, and that's, that we think is the way to implement network security. There are other aspects of security, of course, that need to be addressed, but for um, network security, we think that fine-grained policy is you know, the way of the future. And perimeter security, obviously, we've been talking about the queue for many years now, the perimeter is dead, and, and that is a reality. Yeah. If you're in the cloud, and you get services, like microservices, certainly, mm -hmm. anything API is just a, now the surface area for an attack. What's the big focus now in, when the perimeter's gone? Is it securing the workloads around the data? Is it the app? I mean, how do you guys look at that specifically? So I think security to be effective has got to be multi-layered. So um, you know, if you talk, if you look at what CoreOS is talking about with the trusted computing model, I think that's very important. And people are talking about ways to ensure that the workload that's running is actually the one that you think is, is running. Um, and then at the network layer that where we're sitting, it's important to be able to describe in a very high level terms that application developers can, um, you, you can actually write down very simply, you know, who has to talk to whom, who's allowed to talk to whom, and then you can really lock down those interfaces as tightly as possible. So being that you're a fairly new company, are there any, um, one of the things that, that also was talked about today in the OpenStack community, and really evolving it is sharing successes. We talked about some of the challenges that go in with implementing, you, ma you mentioned uh, uh, a telecom company, or cable company rather, that was having challenges with older version. It's, it's not, how do we do this massive lift and upgrade? From that perspective, how are you helping, or where do you see the impact for customers that Tigera can influence um, in terms of infiltrating that multi-security layer approach? Yeah, um, so I think the, if, we, if I look at the kind of customers that we're working with and the people that are deploying uh, Calico today, um, it's, it, there's a number of different use cases, right? A number of different drivers. One is people are fed up with the complexity of traditional virtual networking and they look at what they're trying to do and say, really, I just need to get IP packets from, you know, from A to B across the network. How hard can that be? Why am I building huge clusters of distributed controllers to, to make this all happen and, and wrapping packets in, you know, in, in, in layers? So we simplify the networking and that's one of the big use cases is just to remove those layers of complexity. Um, you know, an, another is people starting to look at hybrid cloud, right? And and by and hybrid in multiple senses, right? One is public and private, and another is OpenStack and Kubernetes, right? So, or you know, OpenStack and Docker, right? So so being able to network seamlessly between these environments and apply this a common set of security policies across those multiple environments. So um, we're certainly seeing 
large financials getting behind that. We have some kind of you know Silicon Valley type um, you know large SaaS companies um, deploying the, this technology. So there's, th those are probably the two key things that we're seeing. And I was going to ask you who your target, target audience is with respect to Canal. Can you share a little bit with uh, our audience about what Canal is and who are you targeting with yeah, that? Yeah, ab absolutely. So um, Canal came out of uh, a partnership with CoreOS where, um, so CoreOS had a networking solution for Kubernetes called Flannel and we had a network solution of Kubernetes called, Cana uh, called Calico. Our strength was very much in simple networking with uh, very strong security policies applied to it. Um, Flannel uh, enabled networking in various cloud environments and we, there were a lot of users of that project that wanted to get Calico's security policies. So we said, we can put these together. We can run the, the security infrastructure over Flannel's transport mechanisms. And that was the genesis of the canal idea. It was rather than try and reinvent the wheel in both projects, let's just put them together and allow them to be deployed together in Kubernetes environments. And the same target audience that you were mentioning previously, or does this allow a little bit of breadth expansion? Yeah, I think um, anyone who's looking at deploying mic you know, orchestrated microservice environments, looking at Kubernetes uh, in particular, which is you know, the primary target for Canal. Um, in in OpenStack, it's a little bit broader instead of enterprises, I think. So on the DevOps equation, VMs were a big part of expanding the server sprawl, which became VM, VM sprawl. Yeah. Um, now with Docker containers and Kubernetes, the need for VMs kind of are shifting. Yeah. How is that impacting that world? Because the DevOps ethos certainly has done well. That's right in your wheelhouse where you guys are coming in kind of as it goes mainstream. Um, do, you f do you find customers are looking to throw away the VM architecture and go with Docker containers? Yeah, so I, th I think it's mixed right now. Um, what we're seeing is increasingly new application development is targeting containers. Um, and people love the, uh, the orchestration environments that have been built for that world, right? So they love the fact that you just describe the, the ultimate architecture that you want to get and press a button and magic everything, happens. Ma magic happens yeah. and <laughs> containers are created and yeah. or they're destroyed if demand goes away and you know, it, it, it all just works without you having to think about each container you know, as a, an entity you care about, yeah, yeah. right? Um, it takes a human out so of being an admin, it, if you will. Exactly. And, uh, you know, it, so they see that, and then they also have a lot of workloads that are running in VMs today and are going to run in VMs for many years' time, but they want to apply those orchestration techniques to the VMs. And so I, I think that's, that's what we're, so we're kind of seeing the VM world being pulled into this uh, container orchestration um, way of thinking about things. So when you, did the, when you guys did the whole VC kind of tour, 13 million is a good Series A round, congratulations. Thank you. you. They don't just write big fat checks, you have to do some due diligence. What was the core problem that you guys solved that got their attention? Obviously NEA Tier 1 VC, and obviously Peter Wagner at Wing, uh, specialist, more especially VC, but you know, two good firms. Yeah. What did they hone in on? What was the core problem? that you solved? I'm sure they didn't say, oh, we're solving OpenStack problems. It was probably a different issue. What was the core issue? Yeah, I think the, um, you know, the, the core thing that they really zeroed in on was this idea that the, the way sec you secure networks, it's an, it's an open field right now, in particularly in terms of public cloud, and particularly in terms of these new orchestration environments. So pe it's essentially people were replicating the old perimeter security model in a virtual environment, and they realized that the much finer grain approach that we were taking um, you know, could really redefine how you think about security in, in the world going, going forward. Specifically application development. Uh, and on how, top of cloud. Application and developers and operations folks as well. And I think okay. that, that was one of the light bulbs as well, was um, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about de, you know, developers and how they define the application requirements, but when you start to think about operations, and we talk about DevOps, but they still are two different mindsets, even, yeah. if, even if it's the same person yeah. you know, wearing two hats. <laughs> um, 
you know, the, the ability to define policies on an operational level across a data center, as well as have the application developer define the specific way he wants his application to be built, you know, and combine those. That, that's a really important part, I think, of how the, um, you know, how, how what we do brings those worlds nice. together. So in terms of momentum, a new company, been around since May, you said. You can definitely hear your passion for it, as John was mentioning, the, as you mentioned as well, the, the big $13 million check. So clearly, you articulated very well just now the problem that you were trying to solve. Talk to us about, I saw on your website, not only was this born out of a conversation over beers, seeing a pattern yep. here with the Brits, <laughs> um, but also, in terms of growth, and I know that you're hiring, talk to us about how you're leveraging not just the momentum on the technology side, but the momentum to create a culture within Tigera that can drive your growth into the future. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think every startup founder, you know, one of the passions that you have building a startup is you want to build a culture that's, you know, right for where you are today, but also going to build, a, a, you know, a long a company long into the future. And you know, we, we talk a lot about this internally, um, and particularly when we look at our hiring plans, you know, there's, looking a year ahead, there's going to be a large proportion of the company who weren't part of that founding team. So how do we create the right culture such that you know, we, we maintain what we've got to, to start with and, you know, and build on that, and, and attract the right talent as well? Um, so you know, it, it comes out of the passion that we have, but that, that only gets you so far, right? I think you know, trying to build a culture of transparency, particularly in an open source based company, you know, one of the things that attracts people into that kind of environment is they like the open community aspect of it and they expect a company internally to work in a, in a similar way, right? So we communicate very openly with our partners about what we're trying to do. We communicate internally very clearly with, um, you know, with all the employees about what the strategy is and, and how we're thinking about things. So, you know, that, that I think is, a, is an important part of it, and allowing everyone within the team to shape that and to, and to push the envelope themselves and to, um, you know, to grab the, you know, the community interactions. And one of the things people love is all the meetups and these kind of events and really getting to be part of a, a bigger community. And I think as a, you know, as a relatively small company, but, you know, that's what open source brings. It's, it's what um, you know, the OpenStack community and ecosystem has done brilliantly at and the Kubernetes world and the Cloud Native Computing Foundation that's building around that is, is you know, that, that, that's really been what's driving the, you know, the, the leading edge of technology in the industry now and people want to be part of that. Excellent. And, Andrew, talk about what you guys are going to work on this year. What's your goals as we wrap up here, this segment here, OpenStack, obviously it's cloud, it's open cloud, a lot of cloud action. What's your goal for the company? What's some of the milestones you're going to do? What kind of events do you guys want to go to to get your word out? Yeah, so um, for, for us right now, our focus is on adoption and momentum of the open source project. So, you know, obviously you don't go get a check from VCs without some idea about, you know, being able to commercialize. But, you know, one of the things we really liked about NEA as an investor was that you know, they got the open source model and they understood that unless you build a broad-based community around a, a valid open source offering that really you know, works for a broad set of use cases, then you're never going to be able to build a commercial company on top of that. So, um, so really all of our you know, short and medium term objectives are around building that community. Engineering hires. Uh, engineering hires, community advocates, the partnerships that we're building, you know, having a lot of partnership conversations here, and, and uh, you know, things like the Canal project with with CoreOS, um, integration with tech, with Tectonic, but integration with the OpenStack vendors as well. Um, so, so contributing code is part of the contributing code. Plan. We absolutely. I mean, one of the things that we have is we, you know, we have goals for number of users we want to see out there, and it's been fantastic seeing a large number of users uh, adding, adding into the community. You know, we have hundreds of uh, end user, you know, large companies now participating in the community, but also contributors. You know, we, we have folks like, um, you know, folks like Cisco contributing code in, into the project and being part of, part of what we're doing. And, and that's fantastic, you know, and that's one of the things I tell my engineers is, you know, even if it's, even if it takes you more time to work with an external partner to help shepherd a contribution through, 
the value to that of the community uh, than it would have taken you to build that yourself. The value to the community of building people outside of our company who are experts in the code and who are integrating and meshing it into other things that they're doing yeah. is, is massive and that, that's a multiplier it's effect. so interesting, just to end the segment, share your thoughts on just how different this mindset is just from 10 years ago. Oh, I mean, yeah. I mean, completely different. Right? I mean, you would have said, hey, what are you working on now? 20% of your time, tops. Get the code shipped. A absolutely, and I think uh, 10 years ago, people had only just started to think about open source as a business model, and there was a kind of open source 1.0, which was a cheaper, more cheerful ver you know, yeah. version of- Second tier citizen. Established second tier citizen. Now, open source is where the innovation is happening. That is the leading edge of technology is all happening in open source and the best and the brightest engineers want to be in that it's space. It's also a recruiting opportunity for you guys, Absol right? I absolutely. Mean, Abs your absolutely. Your code speaks, it's like your literature. Yes, <laughs> yes. Like Martin as a keynote today, the old way was Gartner Magic Quadrant. The new way is code. Yeah, ab absolutely, and people look to you know, the vibrancy of the community you know, yeah. as, as a, uh, you know, to, to see whether this is something they want to go deploy. Awesome, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE and sharing your perspective, really appreciate it. Um, we'll have some beers later. Thank you for having us reception. here. Yeah, we'll come up with some <laughs> more great ideas over beer. There you go. <laughs> All right, we are here inside theCUBE, the hot startup, fresh funding, open source, can making contributions. Thanks so much for coming on, NEA funded, great company. We'll be right back with more live coverage here in Silicon Valley, this is theCUBE. I'm John Furrier with Lisa Martin. We'll be right back with more after this short break. You're watching theCUBE.